Hello everyone. Um, I mean, I'll wait for some of you to start joining, but uh, my name is Irini. I am one of the um, coordinators of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, the Youth Biodiversity Network. And we are here today to have the second episode of our Nature Talks series, which is a series we have created on the road to the uh, International Biodiversity Day that is coming up this Saturday. We kicked off this series yesterday with a chat with Generation Climate Europe, and now we are going to have the second episode, and this time we have Client Earth with us. Um, let me invite Client Earth to come on stage with me. And now we'll just have to wait for Client Earth to respond on that. And yeah. We're excited to, to host Client Earth today because um, it's an organization that is unlike any other um, out there. What they do is that they are trying to uh, use the law in order to uh, bring system change. So I'm still waiting for, I have invited Client Earth to join and I have to wait for Ioannis to join us. Okay. Ioannis, are you there? Nice. Hi. Okay. I can't hear you. It's maybe, um, I'm not sure if it's my connection or if it's your connection, but I, I, I think we have some problem with the connection anyway. But I guess Ioannis will come back. In the meanwhile, I can tell you who Ioannis is. So Ioannis is a young lawyer. Um, I think he's a young lawyer. He's going to tell us more about that. Um, that he's working with the Wildlife Habitats Program of Client Earth, and he's focusing on international and European biodiversity governance. Um, Ioannis, can you hear us? Okay, we lost him. I see some people in the chat saying I also can't hear him, so I guess that means it's not me. Uh, that has the internet connection issues, but that's also the case with online meetings. Sometimes the internet is not on our side. I will try to invite him again. Let's see. Hi. Hello, I don't know what happened. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I, I was out of words to say. <laughs> <I didn't laughs> How are you, Ioannis? It's so nice to speak to you, finally. How are nice you? Thing. And thank you so much uh, for inviting me today. I am fine here in Brussels after uh, a week of rain. We finally have some sun, so I'm very <laughs> happy about it. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's, it's still rainy in Vienna, where, I'm currently, where I currently am, but hopefully it will get better over the weekend, because now also the lockdown is you know, starting to go away and maybe we can go out and see some people finally in person. But that's lovely. Um, okay, so thank you so much for joining us today. You are our second guest, so we're very, very new to this Instagram Lives things, but uh, we're so excited that you and Client Earth, of course, agreed to join. I already introduced Client Earth and a little bit you, uh, but maybe you want to introduce yourself as well for, uh, for our audience. Thank you so much. Again, thanks for, for inviting me. So just an, uh, another intro about Client Earth, although you already said the most important thing. So uh, we're trying to use law uh, as a tool uh, to tackle the, the biggest environmental challenges. So that is from climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, but also environmental uh, injustice happening around the world. So the objective is to, to hold both businesses and, and countries uh, accountable for their environmental obligations. And we do so either by, by helping to, to shape the law, but also by helping to, to enforce the law. Uh, and uh, about me, uh, so yeah, I've been working in, in client earth for a bit over a year now as a lawyer. I am uh, at the EU level, I am following the, the process on the legally binding restoration targets that were announced uh, by the Commission last year in the EU biodiversity strategy, um, if you are aware. Um, so this is kind of the, the planning tool of the European Commission for all the biodiversity relevant policies for the next 10 years. And of course, it's very important to have uh, binding targets on, on, on restoration because it means that 
uh, if countries, if member states practically fail to meet these targets, uh, we can take them to court, maybe. So <laughs> maybe. <laughs> 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 no, but additionally, um, at the international level, I'm following the, the process for the Global Biodiversity Framework. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this is uh, kind of, of, of the framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And uh, if the pandemic allows us, uh, the, the conference of the parties will take place in, in October in, in China. So hopefully this will happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. And yes, we are... Uh, we're also engaged in all of these processes and we're excited to sometimes see you there um, and see familiar faces uh, fighting the, the good fight with us. Cool. Okay. So as you mentioned, Client Earth is working a lot with around law. So is using law as, as an instrument, let's say as a tool, as an ally in order to, um, to, to look after our planet. But environmental law mm, can be challenging because you often end up you know, defending the defenseless, the people that do not have power or getting to the side of the people that do not have actually power or even to the side of nature in cases. And it's sometimes hard to enforce law when environmental problems are transboundary because of jurisdiction issues and all of these. So could you tell us about one major legal success of client earth or one that in your opinion is, you know, particular significant or even one where you had the chance to work yourself on and you're proud of it? So, yes, indeed, it's difficult. And I like the defending the, the defenseless statement, because imagine that in many cases, there is not even a legal subject to the protection, at least not in the sense that we approach it. So it makes enforcement a bit more difficult. And uh, this, of course, becomes even more difficult if we're talking about uh, kind of a transboundary issue of environmental degradation. There are cases where you don't know what the source of pollution is or that you may need uh, more countries to cooperate in order to to alleviate uh, the problem. And uh, that's not always feasible or and that makes law even more difficult. Different legal systems from different countries may apply. Um, uh, yeah. And like even in, in the case of, of, of the EU uh, enforcement wh where we have uh, stronger laws potentially or more comprehensive laws, we, we still see that uh, enforcement of environmental law is very difficult. Um, now on the on the a client earth, maybe success or positive story. Um, I think one that really resonates with me uh, is one that uh, our colleagues in, in Poland are actually working on. So uh, led by uh, lawyer Agata, a colleague of mine. And um, this relates to the Bielowieża forest. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, Bielowieża is one of the oldest forests in Europe, practically. And it's also uh, like a biodiversity hotspot. It is a host to the, uh, the bison, the European bison, and also some rare uh, uh, links uh, as well. And so uh, some years ago, uh, there was a, a decision from the Polish Ministry uh, uh, of Environment to practically um, allow logging to happen in this old growth primeval forest. And uh, there was, of course, a massive, massive reaction from, from grassroots movements, from, from youth initiatives, from, from the scientific community that really uh, acknowledge that this would be uh, destructive and client earth conducted a legal assessment and uh, indeed established that there is a violation of, of EU law as this uh, forest was uh, a protected area. It was part of the Natura 2000 network. Uh, so the problem there was that there was no access to justice at national level to to challenge these forest management plans. So after trying to approach the ministry, uh, Client Earth notified the European Commission about this, uh, this potential violation of law. And the European Commission initiated a legal process called infringement proceedings. Uh, and in the end, since the, the government would not do anything to, to stop the logging, we, the, they went to the European Court of Justice. So uh, the European Co Court of Justice even uh, very quickly published uh, a ruling on, on interim measures that logging should be banned. And uh, it's kind of emergency rulings uh, from the court on nature conservation are not often. So this was definitely uh, a win. Uh, yeah, so I think this was uh, a really um, uh, powerful case, especially since afterwards, 
the Polish government still didn't stop the logging. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so then the European Commission even demanded from the court to impose financial penalties for every day that the government would not comply with, uh, with the order of the court. And the government indeed issued a fine of, uh, I think, 100,000 euros per day of uh, non compliance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was quite uh, quite interesting. And in the end, ever since April uh, 20, 2018, there is no long no more uh, logging conducted in um, in Bialovieja. So Client Earth really uh, mobilized uh, this case alongside many other uh, NGOs, both national and uh, international. Okay, this story is super, super inspiring. I had no idea, but it's honestly one of the most, like, you know, it, it, it's, it's powerful. It makes me feel empowered in the things that we can achieve if we mobilize all together. I do have an extra question on that because I'm curious uh, on your take on it. Um, why do you think this case actually was, you know, successful or had a positive outcome? Is there an element there that you consider um, important in, in, having, in having this successful element, the successful outcome there? I think uh, especially because this forest was quite emblematic. So this forest had a lot of cultural and historical significance also for the people. And uh, on top of the fact that indeed Europe does not have many old growth forests left. So it was considered as something very uh, valuable also for the commission. This is, I think, what really attracted the, the commission's attention mm -hmm. because there are many cases of, of violations of such laws where we have illegal logging going on but i think in this case it was really the significance of of the forest as well as the the really wide mobilization of civil society i think this is always uh, uh very important because it's a way to push uh change to happen Mm -hmm. So there, in a way, there was a consensus between the, the civil society movements and the policymakers that had the actual power to, to make a difference in that. So that's super, super impressive. Um, okay, now moving on. Um, when you introduce yourself on Client Earth, you said you're working a lot on um, ecological restoration and how we can have, you know, binding elements in that here in Europe. So um, where do you think environmental law can, can play the bigger role when it comes to promote or enforce, let's say, um, if we can use this word, ecological restoration, especially in the context of Europe? Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, I think it's important to know that there is right now a kind of legal gap in, in okay. Europe because there are no clear or kind of far-reaching obligations from, for member states to restore nature, especially outside the, the protected area network. So, um, the, and given the fact that uh, natural restoration processes may take years or even decades to see the result, uh, we obviously need a kind of policy response that can take that into account and can indeed provide uh, permanent or long-term protection. And law, a legal intervention, is definitely uh, uh, the best way to do so. Uh, so I think this would be the, the added value of the new legislation, but I think it would be definitely an omission or a mistake to just call for new law and not take into account that we already have very strong laws uh, uh, within the EU that uh, will also need to be implemented. And I think that in the end, if we want to achieve um, uh, ecological restoration for a bigger area expansion in the EU, we also need to equally focus on implementing uh, already existing laws. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, that, that makes total sense and that ties up very well with, with the next question that I have for you, which is, um, could you briefly tell us what is what is happening right now regarding this restoration law that you are uh, talking about? What What should we be looking for uh, for the next month, for example, or if there are any chances in the next month for, for the civil society to be involved um, in, in shaping this, uh, this new law? So uh, currently uh, the commission is in the process called impact assessment of mm -hmm. the law, which means that they have already kind of announced that they uh, want to, to draft this law, but they're currently exploring the different legal options, what this law, law would entail. And this is practically what they will be doing for the next uh, uh, month or so. And then they will be 
uh, uh, presenting the results of this impact assessment uh, uh, to several uh, um, commission services uh, in order for them to, to approve, to provide their expert input, etc. I think that at this level, where the commission is still at this kind of internal exploration uh, level, it is very important um, for, for civil society to intervene, just even by, by sending uh, 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 messages to, to the commission or by participating in some uh, stakeholder workshops that they are currently uh, organizing. Um, mm -hmm. Already they had two rounds of, of uh, public consultations going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was the chance for, for civil society to actually provide their, their input and uh, uh, there, up, up until now, there has been a very wide and uh, overwhelming response from NGOs. It is really something that is in the interest of, of a very big part of the society, this legislation. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. That. Cool. No, that's, that's super, super interesting. I'm wondering, is Client Earth, like, something, of course, if you can share, like, um, is Client Earth preparing something over the next month that we should be aware of and something that we can potentially, you know, contribute if, if our audience wants to contribute in that? Yes. Uh, so we had already in the past uh, with some other uh, NGOs uh, published uh, a position paper that out outlined our, uh, our positions at that point. But obviously right now and reflecting the outcomes of the workshops that we are attending with the Commission, uh, we are planning to also circulate uh, uh, more on that in uh, our efforts to to kind of influence the and highlight the best direction that this instrument should have uh, something that would work legally something that would be so our focus is that uh, this legislation is not just a new paper park you know it doesn't create uh, restoration only on paper but it is actually an enforceable piece of law uh, that can be helpful for member states uh, and especially given the fact of the post-pandemic economies, we need to obviously make something realistic, but we obviously also need to take uh, into account what science says. So we urgently need to restore nature, both for the sake of biodiversity, but also for the sake of, of halting climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, also by, by, by hearing what you're saying, I feel... Um, that restoration could also, you know, support, apart from biodiversity and the, the climate crisis, uh, the, the right of people to a healthy environment, but also potentially what, as a buzzword, is being called, you know, a green recovery uh, in the sense of if we invest in things like um, restoration and we actually implement things like restoration, maybe we also have a chance, you know, to create jobs for youth that are, are more um, green than the, the, the current uh, ones. Um, so... Going on to the next question, um, and since you mentioned, for example, the restoration and the, and the relationship we can have with climate change, and I, I would, if, if I can say that, uh, the relationship we can have with climate justice in a way, because we know that usually, um, you know, communities that are more affected, even within Europe, from, from the climate change and the biodiversity loss, and they live closer to very polluted areas, are, are usually communities that um, are, in a way, marginalized, um, let's call it uh, like that. So. Um, the claim for a right uh, for the right to a healthy environment uh, seems to be more and more prominent within the environmental narrative and environmental discourse. So, could you maybe tell us something about that? Do you think that the path to ecological re restoration could, you know, benefit from the incorporation to, of these rights of the right of people to a healthy environment? And can people, on the other way, um, take a, um, be benefited from from ecological restoration as well? Uh, yeah, so the, the short answer uh, to this uh, question is that yes, uh, uh, restoration had, can definitely uh, benefit from the right to a healthy environment. And there are different ways for it to be, uh, for the right to a healthy environment to be beneficial for ecological restoration. So, um, yeah, we'll start with maybe the most obvious one, but also um, one of the most powerful ways, which is uh, using human rights litigation for the benefit of the environment. So taking legal action in court uh, by using human rights arguments and practically claiming that uh, a human right is being violated due to environmental degradation 
is a way to go. And it is something that has been happening uh, uh, lately. Uh, for instance, the, the Ar 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 Arhenda case, or the Dutch Arhenda case, for instance. And there are different small, from a legal perspective, there are some differences in the approaches that, that people take. So one is obviously talking about the right to a healthy environment, but I wanted to know that this is not a universally recognized right by the UN. So it is indeed a right that exists in many national, uh, national uh, laws and uh, um, constitutions, but it is not yet a right recognized by the UN as such, although there are some regional human rights courts that recognize it. What, what happens most times, and I think is quite interesting, is to try and find all the environmental components of other human rights. So for instance, the right to life or the right to housing and shelter, the right to food, the right to water, all of these rights, or because you mentioned um, um, marginalized communities, or for instance, indigenous peoples, the right to enjoy one's culture as well uh, can, be, can have an environmental aspect or environmental component. So in this sense, if we use human rights litigation that can take maybe, uh, can have more hype or more publicity and is sometimes more powerful than environmental litigation, we can definitely um, assist uh, also the, the ecological restoration narrative. Um, but there is also another way of going about it that I would say is still beneficial both for nature and for, um, for the people because that should be the end goal. Uh, always, uh, and this is uh, the human rights based approach to to governance or to policy making or to anything. So, based on this approach, it means that human rights are both the means and the goal to every governance initiative. So, um, uh, that we really should take into account uh, human rights, both their uphold upholding human rights, but also promoting hu human rights when talking about conservation, sustainable use, or nature restoration. Okay, now, now you spoke directly to my heart because this was all my work in university, like the rights-based approach to protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures and how this can actually bring a change to how we approach conservation. So I'm super happy to hear that there are also, you know, um, similar discussions when it comes to restoration because my feeling is, you know, restoration is going to be here as as a, as an idea, as not a movement, definitely for the next decade. And now it's it's a good time to already set the foundations over what approach we want to restoration, not wait another decade or two and then try to, you know, um, make a change the way it has happened so far with, with conservation. That's super, super cool. Thank you so much for this answer. And now we have, you know, a more personal question, let's say, for you. Uh, you're a young lawyer, you're a young person, a young professional. You told me that you've been working with Client Air for almost a year now. So it's, you know, it's you're starting your career and you're navigating through this wild space that environmental issues are. So how do you feel in general about the legal developments that are happening right now in the field of environment? Are you um, I don't know, are you positive about them? Do you think that we are really not doing enough? So yeah, what's your take on that? So, I mean, on the one hand, I think that we are uh, really listening much more uh, to um, a lot of concerns from the policymakers on, on environment and on environmental justice. And so we see more laws because laws are kind of a response to this kind of growing societal awareness to uh to environmental degradation but i don't think that more law necessarily means good law you know uh law is a quite neutral tool so many times you can have law simply perpetuating business as usual and uh, equally contributing to environmental degradation or on the other hand you can have some very ambitious pieces of legislation that are very detailed and seem seem great and so i would be very happy to see them but in the end they stay unenforced forever or for several years. So I am, in a way, I, I want to be positive and optimistic, uh, but I think that in, in many times the approaches that are being uh, taken uh, kind of contribute to business as usual in many ways. So I think that uh, what we need in order to, to shift and change this narrative is really to go for comprehensive legislation, so so good law, but also equally focusing on 
on proper implementation of the law, because without implementation, it's as if nothing happened, and also respect for the rights of, of the individuals and the communities that are potentially affected more by environmental degradation and uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have one more question exactly on that. I mean, you, your answers make, make me have so many questions. I'm trying to, you know, hold myself back so I can't keep you here for an hour or so. But you mentioned again and again in your response, the good law. Like, what is an element, uh, or if you want to say the top three elements that you would see in a good environmental law? And I know that this is a very general question because it's context specific and everything. But yeah, if you, if you have this answer, I would be very curious to, to hear. So I would say that as a first element is that, uh, it, that each law does not exist in a vacuum. So it is part of a system and it needs to be able to coexist with the rest of the laws, but also with the rest of the policies from other sectors. So what we see very often is that environmental legislation may be quite okay in, in, in writing, but in the end, it may not have enough links to legislation in other sectors or like energy or trade. So I would highlight this as a first um, element of good law. Um, then as a second element, I would highlight a law that uh, can be easily implemented or enforced. So a kind of law that is actionable, that does not need 10 years of additional methodology development um, in order to be uh, implemented. And then as a third component, I would uh, add uh, that the law has been um, uh, adopted pursuant to a public consultation process. So it has been kind of, it, its potential impacts on people ha have been assessed and uh, different stakeholders have had the chance to actually provide their informed and detailed opinion on on, on this law mm -hmm. okay so yeah uh, i hear you so we we really need to basically mainstream this law in different sectors and we need to base this law in in polyphony and we also have to to make sure that we don't delay the process okay that's that's in a nutshell and in more simple words than uh than yours um okay uh now uh we mentioned a lot in their chat so far we haven't focused solely on biodiversity i think both you and i referred a little bit to climate um but these um let's say these environmental issues these socio environmental issues they are often uh treated in silos and they are treated in in different boxes so uh, what could we do? I'm not sure if you want, you know, to, to tie that to a law or anything. I just need, want your personal opinion on that. What can we do to foster better collaboration between people that work on biodiversity issues and people that work on the climate crisis issues to break down those silos? Because I really feel that that's the only way forward right now. Uh, I agree with you. I also think it, it really is the only way forward. And I think in the first part or the first step would be to really understand that the two crises are deeply interconnected. So, uh, for instance, um, climate change really affects biodiversity. The coral reefs, I think, are the first example that come to everyone's mind. But on the other hand, also bio, uh, biodiversity or uh, healthy ecosystems are essential um, car for carbon sequestration, so carbon removal and carbon storage. So, uh, we need to understand that the crises are connected and also that at a policy level, they can only be addressed together. So if uh, a certain policy that is uh, beneficial for climate is destructive for biodiversity, it should not be adopted practically. You know, like, for instance, these, I don't know if you've heard about these initiatives of uh, forest plantations, like using monocultures for, mm -hmm. for climate change. And... This can be biodiversity destructive, and obviously it has human rights, uh, uh, leads to human rights violations as well. Uh, so I think this would be one. And the other thing um, I think would be to take a bit more into account the implications of biodiversity collapse uh, uh, and link it to intergenerational equity. Uh, because I, I know that uh, Global Youth Biodiversity Network has worked on, on intergenerational equity. And I think 
There has been a lot of discussion on intergenerational equity when it comes to climate, but not as much when it comes to, to biodiversity. So um, already within our lifetime, we are going to see the escalation of uh, and the consequences of business as usual. So the next generations will most likely not get to see some of the amazing species or amazing habitat types that we may be able to, to see. And uh, yeah, so I think in order to foster better understanding, we need to link the two. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has happened, I mean, already many times. One case I really like where this has happened very successfully. I don't know if you've heard, but like in, in Colombia, mm -hmm. uh, a group of children and, and youth filed a lawsuit against the Colombian government that ended up in the the Supreme Court and uh, the, the court actually recognized the rights of future generations. So it uh, ordered the, the government to kind of stop logging in the Amazon um, because the future generations would have their rights violated if this practice continued. So uh, this is maybe a great idea for us uh, in the EU to... <laughs> <laughs> to start shooting everyone <laughs> yeah no i mean that's that's definitely a case and indeed global youth biodiversity network is very interested in bringing the language of intergenerational um equity in there um my my very very personal take in that is that it's not only you know you mentioned the future generations and we do mention a lot of future generation in 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 our um storytelling as well but i think it's equally important to refer to the fact that um, the climate and the biodiversity crisis are currently, you know, affecting the current generations, uh, our generations in, 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 in many areas around the world. Maybe we don't see that heavily in Europe, although there are cases where we see it, but especially in places where we see, um, you know, drylands uh, replacing other areas, etc. This this is already um, affecting their rights to, to, to food, as you refer before, and their rights to, to shelter and their rights to culture in many, many cases. So it's, it's definitely current generations as well. And I think this ties very well with um, a question that I'm seeing from the audience. Um, there is somebody asking, uh, what do you think about incorporating rights of young and future generations in the Human Rights Declaration? Have you ever worked on this topic or do you think this could be a good addition? Um, so I definitely think it would be a good and significant addition uh, because the fact that we have not included it yet, maybe there wasn't a need or there wasn't the, the public pressure for it, but now there is a public pressure for it. And I think it should be uh, included because it would definitely give a stronger uh, political momentum for uh, to argue uh, to to have legal arguments also on the on intergenerational equity, but um, even its recognition in the declaration would not necessarily mean that this becomes an actionable right that you can take governments to court for. So that would then depend on how each government recognizes the right um, individually within their own jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. yes, I think. It very important. Uh, it would have political significance and it could maybe mobilize finally mm -hmm. in some years to recognize it as an actionable legal right. Mm -hmm. So to, to understand it better, you, you think that would be you know a good start to just start paying attention to that? So maybe then uh, national uh, governments can start thinking of incorporating that. That's yes. a super interesting. Yeah, please. No, I think I interrupted Although you. I no, I think it is, uh, this is one way of going forward, but in another way is obviously starting with a bottom-up approach. So pushing national governments first to recognize the right. That's and it true. may That's be more effective in some cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so there is one more question. People are very, uh, I think they are as curious as I am uh, with, uh, with your work. And there is a question here asking, the United Nations has a special repertoire on human rights and the environment. Is there something similar at the EU level or is this mandate left to the Commission and the European Court of Justice or somebody else? I mean, uh, that really depends. When it comes to uh, EU policy making, this is the Commission's mandate, uh, although each uh, directorate focuses on, on one topic, but they ensure that they kind of cross-reference or consult with the other directorates in order to not have 
kind of cacophony between the uh, the policies that are um, promoted and adopted eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I already have five more minutes from, from your time, but uh, I have one last question for you. Uh, and it is, again, you know, to inspire maybe our audience to take up a, a, an environmental legal career. Um, so as a young professional, what would be your best advice for students, for, for people starting uh, right now their career uh, that want to, you know, contribute to that either on the national, regional, international discussions about biodiversity? What's, what's your best advice on that? Um, I think that, I, again, as I said before, I think that gathering information is definitely important and that can range from finding out about uh, a major development maybe in your municipality that may um, cause environmental destructions, but it may also mean becoming aware of what may happen at the other end of the world, uh, you know, and um, the injustices that people may suffer there. And I think that organizing collectively at, at this point that we are at is definitely something, <laughs> is definitely a very important way to go. So it, joining grassroots movements and uh, uh, advocating for environmental protection, but also for, for environmental justice and for increase of of public participation. And I think that the youth movement is a, is a great example for that because there has been a, a great increase in public participation of youth organizations in international fora. So you see in, in the climate change uh, conferences or in the biodiversity conferences, youth is considered a major stakeholder group and that is important. So the opinion has gravity. So I would say that advocating for such modalities to be developed in uh, a national or regional level is equally important and can bring about change. That's lovely. Th thank you for these words. It's always nice to hear, you know, from from fellow um, workers in the in the environmental movement that they really believe that collective uh, action is, is the way to go forward. Um, so, Ioannis, I, I'm very, very grateful for this discussion today for more than one reason. Um, an extra reason that people might not know is that we are both from Greece and these discussions are very, very rare <laughs> in our country. But I am excited that I recent, I'm recently seeing more and more Greek people getting involved in that. So, yeah, let's, let's go Greece to be a more green country as well. Uh, thank you so much and thank you Client Earth as well for, for this uh, chat. Um, and we will be here tomorrow again at the same time with uh, BirdLife Europe uh, and East and Central Asia. Yeah, that's the right name uh, for another Nature Talks. Thank you, Anis, again. Thank you, Client Earth. And thank you everyone for staying with us. <laughs> Ciao.